Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is the annual city meeting, and I'm calling the annual city meeting to order. And the first thing is we will begin with the singing of the national anthem sung by nine-year-old Octavia Devine. Please stand. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think I'll start first with uh, introducing your city council. And um, I'll start uh, on the left with David Austin. Now I have to tell you a little bit about David Austin. Uh, he's not legal yet. Um, uh, as some of you may know, uh, I became mayor when the ma uh, mayor resigned, so I was running for office uh, as an alderman. I can't serve in that position because I'm mayor now. And um, the council uh, elected uh, David to uh, serve out my term. And so after voting day on the, the Wednesday this week, uh, he will be officially a member of the city council, but he's going to be on it anyhow. So here he is. And uh, the next one is uh, Lowell Bertrand. Then we go to the right. We have Matt Chabot. Mark Koenig, Lynn Donnelly, and Deputy Mayor, um, what's your name? Oh. Jeff Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a few speakers before we get into the, the business, and I haven't checked to see whether they're all here, so I'm going to aim for whoever I can see. We do have three legislators that are that are on their way. The legislators generally are moving from one town to another tonight, so they're coming from another town. Hopefully they get here soon. They're and in the car. They're in the car, okay. So let's see who I have here. Chief Merkel. Thank all of you for the support of the Virginia Police Department. Uh, without community support, our job is much harder. And uh, the reason we're as successful as we are is because we have a great community behind us. So I want to thank you for that. <clears throat> Likewise, we've had uh, some unfortunate circumstances, certainly th throughout this past year and even more recently, re more recently within the last month. And I know it may have concerned uh, some people about what Virgins is doing to prepare for school emergencies in the event something like that ever happens. So I've met with uh, city leaders and we are actually <coughs> approaching this from two different positions, one of which is we plan on holding a public forum sometime in the near future to advise parents what to do and what not to do in the event of a school emergency. And likewise, we're also preparing the city infrastructure to respond to any type of emergency, but in particular a school emergency, uh, any of our local schools or uh, the Northland Job Corps, any place like that. So 
I want to let you know we are addressing it. We are working hard on it. And uh, you'll be hearing from us soon. We'll be putting it out in a public forum as far as what the dates are for that, that forum and what we're planning to do as far as training is concerned. So, uh, and again, if you folks ever have any concerns or comments, certainly make sure you come to the Virginia's Police Department or give me a call and I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. And next one, uh, John Stroop from the school district. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here to talk a little bit about the budget and tell you why uh, we support that budget, the 2018-2019 budget. Their Article 5, which is the school budget, and Article 6, which is the bond for capital repairs and energy conservation and school security. I'd also like to make sure that you're aware that uh, other representatives of your school district are here. Chris Cousineau's in the back. And um, if you haven't seen him today, please stop by and see Chris. He's got some surveys. We are really interested in getting connected to you as a community and allowing the information that we need to share with you to come to you and for you all to share with us your interests and needs for the school district. Um, also, the board chair, Sue Rakowski, is here and um, Mark Koenig, who is also a school board member. So um, just briefly, it's a level funded school budget, and, but we believe that it will achieve the learning goals that we have. Um, our superintendent, our principal stand by this budget and we stand by them. And it does make some enhancements in access to the arts. It also makes some enhancements in athletics and in technology. And um, we also would like for you to know about the budget neutral school bond that will allow us to make some much needed improvements to our heating systems, especially here at the high school. Um, and that will expand our energy conservation as well as upgrade our school security and safety systems in all four schools. Um, if you have any questions, um, we know that we've got some serious needs and some um, pressing issues, but we think that this is a responsible budget. And if you have any questions, we'll be glad to take those. Um, see us after, see us, uh, let us know, send us an email. We wrote a, a note to you all in Face uh, Front Porch Forum, and um, please let us know what you're thinking. Thank you. Thank you, John. I failed to, uh, when I was doing introductions, I failed to introduce um, our city manager, Mel Hawley, and our city clerk, Joan Devine, and by the way, that was her granddaughter who did the singing. Shell Brinkman, Solid Waste District. So I'd like to just talk about trash for a moment, because that's what I really like to do. Um, so I'm your representative on the Solid Waste Management Board of Directors, and uh, our district is conducting a survey to gather public input, engage interest in the development and location of a new regional drop-off facility for household trash and recycling and certain additional special waste. Our district currently operates that one centralized transfer station down in Middlebury. But, and that serves all of our member uh, municipalities, but it doesn't allow residents to drop off um, household trash or recycling. So currently what our options are in Addison County is um, if you have curbside service, which can be expensive, but that's an option. And the other option is to go down to the municipal drop-offs. So in Virgins, you know where the municipal drop-off is, and it's open on Saturdays. But there are a lot of um, towns and, um, well not cities, towns in Addison County that don't have as many hours of operation and they're quite limited in where they can bring their trash and recycling. So we're looking into um, potentially opening a, a regional drop-off 
which would be similar to the Chittenden drop-offs. If we open up a regional drop-off, hopefully it would be available most of the time to any uh, resident of Addison County, instead of being very specific for the town that you live in. But in order for us to move forward, we need some input. We need to have that data that says, yes, this is what we want to do. So the survey can be taken online at our website, which is addisoncountyrecycles.org or you can do it on paper, and I have a table in the back of the room that my daughter is sitting at. Uh, you can call them up and do it by phone, and they have some cool prizes as incentives for filling out the survey. $100 to uh, Middlebury money, and a $75 gift certificate to the Bobcat and the Black Sheep Bistro. If you put your name, it can be anonymous, but if you put your name and email on it, you can be entered into the drawing for those prizes. So it's kind of a win-win. So please fill this out. Let us know if there's some improvements we can make in Addison County, or if you just like status quo and, and don't want anything to change. But just uh, you know, give us your input if you could. We'd really appreciate that. You're the official mic dude. I'm the, I'm the mic dude. The mic Any dude. questions? Okay. The next person, since I see one of our legislators is here, is Senator Christopher Bray. Chris, how you doing? Thank you, Chief. Good evening. Whoops. <laughs> Plenty powerful, this microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it's great to be back in Virgins. Uh, again, my name is Chris Bray. I'm one of your two state senators. I live in New Haven and uh, have been serving, this is my sixth year uh, in the Senate and before I was that in the House for four. So in the Vermont Senate, we serve on two committees. There's a, a morning committee and an afternoon committee. In the morning, I chair natural resources and energy. And in the afternoons, I serve on education. So I know you're in the middle of town meeting. Thanks for giving me a little break. And I'll just jump in and talk mostly about the, the major work we've been doing on clean water. So um, in 2015, we passed the Vermont Clean Water Act. and. Uh, the strength of that bill was that it was comprehensive. The motto as we developed it was everybody in. And by that we meant that whether you're talking farmland or forest land, municipal land, developed land, residential land, all of it is part of the state's clean water program. And that makes a lot of sense because rain falls everywhere, so we need to manage uh, water everywhere that it lands. The, the ideal thing is that it would just soak into the ground wherever it hit the ground, but as everyone knows, there is runoff. So then what happens after that is we're managing runoff in order to try to uh, maximize water quality and minimize the negative kind of impacts we see. Um, here in uh, close to Lake Champlain, I think probably everyone knows that this lake has some challenges with water quality. And um, we had the secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources in, and the question I pitched to her and others in this session was, although we obviously we can see some improvements here and there, some bright spots in the clean water work we're doing, that it was our perception that overall, water quality continues to decline in Vermont. And her sobering answer was yes, you know. Uh, so we know we need to uh, continue to work at it, do better, and uh, we also have to be tenacious, uh, fund our, pro our programs for the long haul, not put them on a uh, sort of a, a budgetary roller coaster, which makes it hard to make the kind of commitments and make the steady progress we need to make. So the good news I can share is that we're building right now the strongest program in terms of the program itself and the number of dollars we're committing to it uh, for clean water in our the budget we're building for next year. So fiscal year 19, which begins in July of this year. Um, and the FY19 budget is bigger than FY18, is bigger than FY17, but it's not just about spending money. Uh, we're also trying to make sure that the programs we run are more cost effective than they used to be. We're measuring uh, how effective they are, water quality outputs, and trying to make sure we spend the dollars as cost effectively as possible. Um, one other th thing you may hear about is there is a bill, Senate Bill 
or, or S, S260 that talks about funding clean water work for the long haul. And the challenge for all of us is to make sure that we not only have we picked up our game in the last couple of years, but that we stay at that level or even do better in future years. Um, right now, we can see that uh, a year and a half out, there's potentially a large budget gap of roughly $17.5 million. Um, the administration hopes that the state's economy will grow enough, that revenues to the state will grow enough, that that gap will naturally get filled in. And if, not surprisingly, everyone hopes that that is so. But we, it's such an important investment, um, and it's actually required by law uh, amongst ourselves as Vermonters to have clean water, and also our commitments to the federal government, um, that we want to have a plan B in case those new revenues don't materialize, in case the budgets don't grow as they hope. And so S260 develops a plan for fiscal year 20, so a year and a half out, looking ahead just to make sure that we're well positioned to continue to do more clean water work in the future. And I think, you know, Vergenza is probably particularly conscious of this because of the combined sewer overflows into, uh, into Otter Creek. So there are dollars allocated in all those sectors I mentioned, you know, farms, forests, municipalities, and uh, Virgins will get assistance from the state and the federal government uh, towards its clean water work as well, every town. So I know I'm interrupting your meeting. I don't know if you want to have me, I'm happy to pause and, and see if you have questions or I'm happy to questions? turn the mic back over, uh, your pleasure. Any questions? Get him while he's here. <laughs> all right. Well, so it's uh, an honor to serve you all. Thank you very much. You know, one thing is, so I am uh, visiting five town meetings tonight, and I apologize that I'm not spending the full town meeting with you all. Uh, but I'm always happy to hear from people. As a matter of fact, the, I, I've come to appreciate that, for me, the citizens' legislature is not the hun just the 180 people we elect, but it's the 626,000 Vermonters that very regularly get in touch with us and help us learn more about what's going on, what's working well, what's not working well, and help educate us so that we can do a better job in Montpelier. Um, if you go to the, the legislative website, you can find uh, a, every bill that we're working on. As it's revised, you can keep up with things. And there's also contact information, so you can get my postal uh, in my mailing address, uh, New Haven and Montpelier, uh, phone and email as well. And um, I'm always happy to hear from people. So thank you again. Thank you, Senator. <coughs> and the next one up is Representative Diane Lampert. I see you again. I'm glad the senator was with us tonight. I, I learned something down in Waltham with him there. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing us to take a moment of your time. Oh, you can put your stuff on the oh okay. <laughs> I keep my clipboard, though. Um, many of the faces here have been standing up for 10 years and coming and giving a little bit of an update in the mid midst of our session of what's going on. But there are some new faces. But I'm Representative Diane Lanfer. I live right here in Virgins, and I'm one of your two representatives, and I have been serving you for 10 years, six years on transportation, and four years on uh, House Appropriations Committee. So I'm currently still in House Appropriations, and it's where I spend the majority of my time. My days in Montpelier are um, vastly spent on working on one thing, and that is the budget. And it is, gives me an incredible view of the overview of all of what goes on in state government and, and where the values of spending are placed in, in our state. So we, we've been reviewing and looking at the expenditures that the governor recommended and what others have recommended and hearing from Vermonter's Voice, as well as reviewing some of the reductions that have been recommended and what and where we want to uh, uh, maybe restore and, and, and not, but it looks like we're going to be on, t on target to pass the budget out of our committee on March 16th, 
and we'll be on the House floor with it on the 22nd and 23rd of March. So when I come home on the 24th, because during the week I, I live in Montpelier, so that Saturday when I come home, I am going to crash for that weekend, I'll tell you. <laughs> but the probably, and I'll just talk about one other thing that uh, I find to be of really, really value for all of Vermonters, what is exciting that is happening out of the Ways and Means Committee, that uh, they have been working on the tax bill and on looking at some education reform. And that bill passed out of their committee, uh, uh, it's, it's number H911, which is kind of really funny that it's 911, but it's, uh, it was not planned. But uh, that is gonna do some interesting and incredible things that if you don't mind, I'll just read a few of them. Now remember, this is just out of their committee. It'll be coming to our committee the week that we're back next week. And then, of course, it'll go to the Senate. So it will take some changes, but here's a, a, a mid-session view of what did happen there. If you recall, in December, uh, in Washington, D.C., was passed a federal tax bill. The results to Vermonters with that tax bill was not going to be favorable to Vermonters. And in, in, in total, there, we would uh, look at Vermonters having an increase in their, their um, state income tax by $30 million. So even before we started the session, there was many people that were working on trying to figure out a way how we we're gonna give that back. And so in that bill, it, it achieves that by reducing all of the tax brackets uh, in, in Vermont and actually collapses the two highest ones into one. So that is a, a small reduction, but that gets to it as well as we've expanded, or in that bill expands the uh, Vermont Earned Income Tax Credit. It also creates a 5% tax credit for some charitable giving above uh, $10,000 and a few other items. And um, I will send an email on some of the one pager on that because there's a few other items that it does. The other large, that gets us to 30, the $30 million gives back with that. The next thing it also has in that bill is you've probably have heard that there's been a lot of discussion around how can we help uh, Vermonters who pay uh, income tax on their social security. So within this bill there's also the mechanism to return or not, or to exempt, 100% exempt social security income tax on single filers under $45,000. Mary, sorry I'm out of breath. We ran from Addison. <laughs> well, not no, but I, in the car. <laughs> so married jointly would be 60000 and under. If you're filing jointly and making $60,000 or less, you will be 100% exempt from Social Security income tax. The other piece of this bill, and there's about four points and then I'll stop talking, is the education piece. There was a pretty dramatic push to see what could be done to move education spending away from property tax and more into the income. You probably have heard some of what was going on. And as of even two weeks ago, I might have been able to come home here and to tell you that what we were able to achieve was to be able to reduce your property tax burden by 50%, but by moving that over to income. It was a little aggressive, and there were some things that needed to be ferreted out. Where we've landed on that right now, or where that currently stands is, that it reduces it, but it creates a school income tax surcharge, which would reduce the homestead tax rate by an average of 10%. Okay, but it keeps the income sensitivity and the renter's piece. The original plan had those coming out. So it's a smaller step, but it gets there. It also separates the municipal tax bill from the education tax bill. So if this, if this passes as it is, you would receive one bill from your municipality and one bill around your education property tax. It's a much more transparent and easier to understand tax bill if they're separated. The other thing that it does is a little inside ballpark, but it's the, the general fund. The general fund transfers annually uh, about $322 million over to the ED fund. And regardless of political party or who's in the governorship, there's been gainsmanship as to messing with how much is transferred. And we all recognize uh, astutely enough that if you reduce the general fund transfer, it's putting pressure on property tax. So within this bill, it eliminates the general fund transfer, 
but trades it off by putting 100% of your sales tax into the education fund and 25% of the rooms and meals tax in directly into the education fund and eliminating that little transfer. It also repeals the excess spending penalty. Um, I'll stop talking in all those details before I watch everybody's eyes glaze over and uh, just say thank you for letting me come and give you an update on that. I feel like it's fairly significant news in a direction that I'm happy to be able to bring home. And with that, we'll let uh, Representative Warren. Any questions? Oh. Any questions? Terrific. I get to stay here now. <laughs> thank you, Diane. And You're welcome. Next is Representative Warren Van White. Yes, uh, thank you, Representative Warren Van White from Ferrisburg, my uh, sixth year in the uh, legislature. And uh, one of the key parts of uh, Governor Scott's uh, platform is has to do with affordability. And with that, I'd like to say last year, for the first time in anyone's history, uh, Vermont did not raise taxes or fees, and the, the budget only had the natural growth. Uh, and, and again, this year, the governor is committed uh, to have a, uh, a natural growth, which would see, because of the increase of business, is about a 2.36% uh, growth in uh, state spending, whereas a lot of years we've seen 5% growth in the, in the general fund. As, as many of you know, Vermont, uh, it tends to be an expensive place to live and affordability is important. Uh, I was just talking to a constituent uh, a few weeks ago. He's reaching retirement age and regardless if we ramp down on the uh, tax on Social Security, the property tax on his house is around $6,400 and he figures he could buy a comparable house in Idaho and perhaps uh, pay less than $2,000. So. One of the main themes, uh, what I do, I'm a committee uh, energy and technology, and I ask the question, what does it cost? Because often I call Montpelier the golden uh, bubble because it's kind of a bubble chamber. People are just saying things that everyone wants to hear, and, and they don't often want to know what exactly is this going to cost because some of the things we have in Vermont are very expensive, and. Since I'm on the Energy Committee, we look at the cost of electricity, and Vermont has to compete with a lot of other states. Large businesses in Vermont might see their electricity rates being 20, 30, even 50 percent higher in Vermont. So I, uh, I ask those questions, and as we know, Green Mountain Power just got a 5 percent rate increase, and that may not be their last one. So we have to look at why uh, New England is high and Vermont is right up there and part of it is as much as we may like renewable energy, if we look at the average price of electricity for Green Mountain Power, it's six cents a kilowatt hour, but what, what we see in uh, overall for renewables, it's 21.8 cents. So, so we got to a, keep a close eye on the uh, cost pressures of that because businesses have similar Multi-national uh, businesses have similar facilities in other parts of the country and they consider what the price of production is in Vermont per unit and the electricity cost, as I said, can be so much higher. So if we want to have a place where our children and grandchildren have jobs and good paying jobs, a lot of them like UTC or Global Foundries or uh, AMIA, they're all looking to, to have a competitive price for that. So those are the things I work for in the committee and we especially passed a bill so that some of these companies can do more of their energy efficiency charges. We see it on our bills at maybe 10 or $20 a month. Some of these businesses are seeing over a million dollars a year and, and they wanna use more of that money in, in their own businesses. So. Uh, those are the issues. We look forward to working with the governor to uh, uh, rein in spending. We also, schools too, uh, regardless of how we collect all this money, sales tax, property tax, income tax, uh, we have probably the third highest per pupil spending and, and the lowest uh, student to staff ratio. So we have to look at ways of our schools becoming uh, more affordable also. That's, uh, 
basically my report, and I'd answer a question if anyone has any. Any questions? You know, we're moving into the real interesting part of the meeting. That's the business meeting. So I'm sure you don't have any questions. Okay. Well, we have uh, information on the back table there, reports for most, both Representative Blanford and myself, and as our contact information. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I think uh, we've hit my list of uh, folks who... Uh, want to speak, so we are moving into the business part of the um, of the meeting. So the first uh, item that I need to deal with is a motion from the City Council to approve the minutes of last year's annual meeting, 2017. I'll make that motion. The motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion or changes to those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. So we move on now to the annual meeting warning. And um, there are 21 articles. You're going to be hearing from me for 21 articles. Uh, <clears throat> so the first one is, is Article 1, and it talks about who's getting elected. So I'm going to read from the the, um, the warning and also tell you who is um, uh, running in those offices. So it's to elect by Australian ballot three aldermen with respective two-year terms uh, and the three aldermen that are running are uh, Matthew Chabot, Lynn Donnelly, and me. Uh, <laughs> we don't have any opposition so I think you will see that we get elected. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one lister for a three-year term. Uh, that lister is Christopher Bearer, and there is no opposition there also. One auditor for a three-year term. The auditor is Jennifer Russell. There is no competition in that um, uh, office. One grand juror for, one, uh, for a one-year term. That is Anne Humphrey. Uh, no opposition. One commissioner to the Virgins Patent Water District Board. Uh, of water commissioners for a three-year term, and there is uh, Thelma Kitty Oxholm, no competition there either. Uh, and then we have a uh, one director uh, to the Addison Northwest uh, School District Board of Directors for a three-year term, and that one person is Mark Koenig, and there is no opposition there. I'm, I'm hoping that the no opposition is because people are basically satisfied with pe what people are doing. Uh, but anyhow, so we move on to Article 2. Article 2 is to vote by Australian ballot on the following. Shall the bonds of the city of Virgins in an amount not to exceed $500,000 be issued for the purpose of purchasing a fire truck to replace engine 316? And so in this particular one, I think we'll have a few words from Chief Brewer um, just to describe what's happening here or anybody uh, from the fire department that's here uh, so that people can understand more what's happening. All right, I'm gonna tell you first off, I'm not much of a public speaker, so. This is going to be real short and sweet unless people have a lot of questions. What we're doing is in the process of trying to replace our 1994 engine. Uh, it's a frontline piece, responds to all calls. It's been going since, uh, like I said, it responds to, we average 167 calls, although last year we were way down, which is a really good thing um, for a change. But um, the truck's getting old, you know, getting hard to get parts for. Um, and. You know, I look at how many of you have a car that you rely on, you know, that's a, a 1994 or older, or, you know, most people are in that realm. Granted, fire truck's a lot more expensive, a lot bigger, not used, but the thing about it is it sits in a station, alarm goes off, we go flying into the station, we jump in it, you know, we fly to help anybody out that needs it. Piece of that is, do we want an old truck that's protecting your house or your people or your children or your, your family. I mean, it's at a point now where we gotta start looking at 
replacing equipment as they get older. So that's where I'm at. Um, any questions or? Well, tell them about the, par the parts that you can't replace on it. Well, there are parts. <laughs> that's the other piece of it is, you know, in a 1994 vintage um, truck, and trucks are a lot different than cars. You can you go a lot of times you can go to junkyards and pick parts for a car, or, or they keep parts for cars going a long time. In the engine, we cannot get all the parts so easily. We chase all over looking. Um, right now, we have the, the Class A foam system, which is, is what we use to, uh, when we fight in structural firefighting, we use not just water, but we use a Class A foam, which is a substance that helps us um, protect easier and, and kind of goes through. We use less water when we're actually using it. And uh, the system's down. Um, the, part, the, the system's obsolete. They don't make parts for it anymore. So, you know, we, we chase down wherever, hoping somebody has one on the shelf or looking for, um, you know, we're even at the point where we look at eBay for parts. Um, it's not that, you know, you can't afford to, you know, sit there and have something like that. Okay, I bought the truck in 1994. You can't buy a spare part and sit with a $10,000 part on the shelf thinking, well, maybe it's going to break down sometime. You know, you, you just can't do that with trucks. So at a certain point in time, they just stop making parts for them at the age. Any uh, questions of the chief? Sure. Does the gens respond to other and do we receive any funding from the other You want me to take that? You want to take yeah, that? Sure. You can take okay. it, Melvin. So the answer to that is yes. Uh, the Virgins Fire Department obviously takes care of um, uh, fire service for all properties in the city of Virgins, all properties in the town of Waltham, all properties in the town of Panton, and approximately 45% of the town of Ferrisburg. And uh, the way that we fund the fire department is a formula uh, that we use and whereby the four towns contribute uh, uh, through a contract with the fire department, actually with the, through the city of Virgins, to pay their proportionate share. And so uh, in this instance, uh, this bond will not be, if approved by the voters, will not be funded entirely by Virgins taxpayers. Uh, in this instance, if, if it was to be funded by Virgins taxpayers, uh, the way that bonds work, it's a little different than your home mortgage whereby you go and you get a mortgage and you are paying equal payments uh, on a monthly basis throughout the term of that mortgage. mortgage. The bonds work a little bit differently. So in this instance, this $500,000 bond gets sold through the municipal bond bank and the payments are $25,000 per year for 20 years. Those are the principal payments. And the interest is paid every six months and the interest changes. It actually starts out very low. Uh, it starts out at less than 2% uh, and then grows to slightly over 3%. These are uh, tax exempt uh, uh, municipal bonds. The highest year, uh, the highest payment of the $25,000 principal payment and the interest is just about $39,000. Uh, the portion that is the city of Virgins is 37% of that. And when you do the math, the resulting impact on your tax rate, which the municipal rate is currently 81 cents. Uh, if this bond passes uh, and we uh, sell those bonds and acquire this truck, the resulting tax increase is approximately two thirds of a cent. So if you're wondering if your house, uh, let's say that your, uh, your house is a $200,000 home, uh, and so, you know, two thirds of a cent or two thirds of one percent of that is what your increase would be. Any questions of the chief or the city manager? We purchased, didn't we purchase a truck about three or four years ago, something like this? Has that been paid off? It was actually five, going on six years now, uh, maybe it's in 09 when we, we purchased two used trucks. Um, we bonded 
We, we, the, the voters approved four hundred and fifty thousand dollars five or six years ago. We only end, ended up needing to borrow four hundred thousand dollars. We were able to use uh, some cash carryover in the fire department, so we borrowed four hundred thousand, and so we still owe ten years on that bond, Zig. <coughs> The, we're hoping to sell the truck that we're replacing the 94, um, you know, so it is going to go out. Um, how much we're going to get for it, I have no idea until we really get go through, but that'll help alleviate some of the costs. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. All right, here we go. So, Article 3, to vote by Australian ballot on the following. Shall the city appropriate $3,290 to the Addison County uh, Home Health and Hospice Incorporated, said sum to come from city funds? Is there anybody representing home health and hospice here to speak? Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Tim Brownell. I represent Addison County Home Health and Hospice. And um, I just wanted to thank you for allowing me to speak tonight and also thank you for your support and hopefully your ongoing support as we um, serve our communities. Uh, Madison County um, Home Health and Hospice is a community um, program that uh, actually covers 22 towns within Addison County. Uh, we have done approximately 1,445 patients that we've seen, and uh, out of those 1,445 patients, 182 was in Virgins. So um, again, we, we certainly um, look forward to continued support because it's such, such an important service that we provide to not only our seniors in the community, but also we service our pediatric patients and our um, adolescents as well. So uh, we're a full service um, company. And uh, this year is a, a big year for us. We're celebrating 50 years. And uh, we would not be here if the communities did not uh, support us. So um, again, I just wanted to be brief and thank you. And hopefully the support will continue. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, next is article. Oh. Yes, sure. I'm just a community member who has had an opportunity to use hospice and home health. And I just want to say that as an outside source coming in to work with people in the community who needs medical assistance, they're above and beyond. Thank you. I fully 100% support this article. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, thank you so much for your time. Article four, to vote by Australian ballot on the following, and I'm gonna eliminate that phrase because they all say that. Um, uh, shall the city appropriate $2,000 to the Addison County uh, Humane Society Incorporated, said some to come from city funds. Is there someone representing? Hi, my name's Anya Worm. I am uh, on the board at Homeward Bound, as well as their veterinarian of record, and volunteer there many hours during the week. And we're here to say thank you for your previous support, and also ask for continued support. I wanted to just read a little bit from Just Danielle, the executive director's letter, um, requesting the support. Uh, as the only animal shelter in Addison County, we serve an average of 825 animals each year as the shelter as well as the feral cats in the community and the many animals assisted in our cruelty investigations. We offer programs and services to meet a wide array of critical animal welfare needs facing Addison County. Uh, Homeward Bound operates with an annual budget of approximately 500,000 and receives no funding from federal, state, or local governments. As such, we respectfully request consideration of funding through the town's appropriation process in the amount of $2,000. The funding will go directly to our general operating budget. I did want to just share some numbers specific to Virgins, I think. 
Um, the numbers I found that were most interesting was uh, that there were 29 animals surrendered from Virgins um, and 23 adopted, so that's getting close. Um, another important piece is the number of feral cats that were trapped, neutered, and then released back to their locations. That was 23 cats, and we did about 225 cats in total. So that really, that's a huge uh, bonus to the animal's health that we're decreasing that population explosion that happens. Um, and then the other things, programs that I think a lot of people don't know that Homeward Bound takes part in are um, the Pets Eat Too, which um, people who are getting Meals on Wheels can also get pet food. And Virgens has six people enrolled in that program. Um, we also had one person from Virgens use the Pets in Crisis program, which is if a person, for whatever reason, has a temporary problem where they can't take care of their animal, the shelter will house that animal. And then when things are better for them, they can have their animal back at no cost. Um, and we also have a new camp, and three kids from Virgins came to our uh, camp last summer. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks. Okay, Article 5, and by the way, uh, if you're representing an agency, you don't have to come up to the front. Uh, we'll try and get that microphone to you wherever you are. Uh, Article 5, uh, shall the city appropriate $3,074 to Addison County uh, Parent Child Center? Anyone from? The mayor's saying that you need the exercise, George. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Sue Verkowski, and I don't work for the Parent-Child Center, but through my work with children, I have the opportunity to spend a pretty significant amount of time at the Parent-Child Center to see the wonderful work that they do. And I'd like to, on their behalf, thank you all for the support that has been given in the past and um, tell you a little bit about the organization. Last year, 274 residents of Virgins were served by the Parent-Child Center and the services are intended for any family who needs and wants them. I have basically just a, a list of some of the services that they do provide. The Parent-Child Center helps families to assess their children's physical and cognitive development and provides support services if needed. They offer consultation and support to families and child care providers. Um, they offer playgroups throughout the county and there's actually one that's held right here in Virgins on Wednesday mornings, which I attended with my kids for about a decade. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, they, uh, they offer welcome baby bags and visits to families with newborns to help them become acquainted with services and have follow-up supports available if needed. They have an intensive in-house training program that builds parenting and job readiness skills and serves as an alternative education site for Addison County High Schools. So the kids there actually are earning a high, a high school diploma. They provide high quality children, or I'm sorry, <laughs> high quality child care <laughs> to infants and toddlers, um, many of whom are the children of the, the folks at the center who are getting their degrees, but also any other community members who want to use their services. And the center has re recently renovated a nine resident boarding house in Middlebury, which is a cornerstone of a first time renters program for youth to learn and practice the skills necessary to be successful tenants in our community. And all of these services are free for anyone and can be accessed by calling the Parent Child Center directly. So that is their mission. If there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Article 6, shall the city appropriate $600 to the Addison County Readers Incorporated? Anyone from, thank you. I have to say, okay. Hello, I am Margot Grace. I am on the board for Addison County Readers. We are the local organization that brings Dolly Parton's Imagination Library to children birth um, to age five. We, um, along with Dolly, send free books home to children. It is at no cost at all to the families, but it does cost us about $30 per child. We are asking the people of Virgins to please support um, with the $300 as you have the last several years. 
this past year, as of December, um, we've had 106 for Jen's children take advantage of the program. Um, we're always looking for more children. People who know me know I hand out brochures wherever I am. Um, our goal is to have every child get books. There's no catch at all, um, and we appreciate your support. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Article 7, shall the city appropriate $850 to the Addison County Restorative Justice Services? Uh, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Mackie Gaines. Um, I'm representing um, the Addison County Restorative Justice Services. Um, once again, we're asking for $850 from the town of Virgins. Um, the Addison County Restorative Justice Services provides community restorative justice responses focused on the balanced approach in meeting the needs of the victim, the community, and the offender. The goal is to help the offender develop empathy and accept responsibility while providing compensation of loss for the victims and compensation of resources for the community. Anyone given the opportunity to participate in our program is supported to take responsibility for their actions, connect with the community in a positive way, and learn from their experiences so as not to reoffend and cause harm to yet another person. Um, I've been on the board for about eight years, and I've seen um, some of the, the really good work that we've done. Um, it's not just court diversion. There's um, safe driving, driving while license suspended. There's reentry programs for people who've been incarcerated. And um, the main goal is to make sure that um, we reduce crime and um, also give people a second chance. So we hope you can support us again. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Article 8. Uh, shall the city appropriate $2,500 to AgeWell, formerly known as CVAA? Anyone from AgeWell? My name is Jason Farrell. I'm a resident of Virgins, and I am employed by AgeWell, and I didn't follow his direction because I made my way up here. But um, I wanted to um, thank you all for uh, your previous support. I actually wanted to thank first all the other people who've spoken to um, the need in nonprofit, and I really think that's important that people are getting up here this year more than ever to say, you know, here's what you're doing for our agencies. Uh, nonprofits are having a harder time um, with uh, allocations from state in federal governments, and I think it's important that people in this community recognize the, the, the pressures that are around our budgets and the important work that we do and, and help you understand what that is. So uh, AgeWell is an agency that serves area seniors that are 60 and over, and there's really no uh, other uh, qualification for our services. We serve Addison, Grand Isle, Franklin, and Chittenden counties, uh, and we do that in a number of ways, and I have some... Um, some uh, statistics to help you understand what that is. We provide Meals on Wheels in this county. Uh, we provide care and service coordination, uh, which is social workers that go into the home. And our, our, our mission really is to provide the guidance and support that helps inspire our community to embrace aging uh, with confidence. So the way we do that is providing uh, a, a fleet of uh, services that wrap around seniors and their family members to help them uh, live independently as long as they can. Uh, and that includes providing uh, Meals on Wheels, as I said. Um, we have had over 5,404 meals delivered in the city of Virgins in the year 2017, our, our fiscal year 2017. Uh, we served 2,716 congregate meals. Um, we provided care and service coordination. That is the social worker that goes into the home about, 400 and, about 500 hours, 494 hours of, uh, of, of care and service coordination. And um, we also provide a, a helpline. We had fielded 210 calls to our helpline from Virgin. So um, again, I want to thank you very much for your uh, support. This $2,500 that we're asking for in an allocation I went back and looked at the numbers. This is the same amount that we requested from this uh, city um, in 1999. So we have not increased the uh, request that we've asked for funding, and we very, very much appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Any questions? Article 9. 
Shall the city appropriate $5,000 to the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Virgins? Is there someone from the Boys and Girls Club? Uh, my name is Jill Struby. I'm the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. I'm going to come up front because I don't want anybody to hurt their necks. Um, we have shown tremendous growth from 2016 to 2017 at the Boys and Girls Club, and we are tremendously proud of that fact. Um, we have gone from 75 members to 104 members, which brings uh, and 77 of those members all live here right in Virgins. We serve children from fourth grade through 12th grade, um, and we are getting busier all the time. Our average daily attendance in 2016 was 7.6 children a day. Right now, our average daily attendance is 19 children per day. Today, we have 37 kids show up at the club, which is pretty close to a record. Our best day ever was 52 kids in one day. Um, so we are growing, we are growing quickly, and um, we are asking for more money this year because we are growing so quickly. Um, it's, it's really important. We serve, um, this, the kids are coming in and they have needs every day. Um, one of our biggest um, draws is our meals program with support from the Virgen's Rotary and the Virgen's Food Shelf. We served in 2017 4,196 meals to youth in this community, including 396 breakfasts, 744 lunches, and 3,056 dinners. That comes out to 350 meals per month that we serve to our kids. So it's a super, super important thing that, um, that you're supporting when you support the Girls and Boys Club. Um, we've had 600 hours of volunteer hours from community members in the past year for mentoring, people helping our kids with homework, people coming in and playing basketball with our kids, playing pool with our kids, teaching them card games. Um, it has just, it's, it's been amazing. Um, one statistic that I wanted to share with you is um, in, in uh, the Boys and Girls Club of America does a survey called the National Youth Outcomes Initiative. And they ask our kids questions about what's important to them. It's similar to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And that um, found in 2017 that the most important predictor of youth, positive youth development, is physical safety. Um, kids who feel physically safe are more likely to graduate from high school, attend school more regularly, earn higher grades because they go to school more regularly, and to also volunteer in their community. Our results from the Boys and Girls Club here in Virgins 85% of our children reported feeling physically safe at our club, which I think is really shows we're on the right track and we're doing a great job at what we do, which makes me super, super proud. One quick story I want to leave you with. Um, a couple weeks ago, we asked our children to write an answer or a finish the sentence of why is the girls club important to you or why do you like it? And a couple kids said, well, we like to hang out for friends. And some people said, well, we really like the, the food you give us. And people said, well, we like to play games with our friends. And then one kid wrote, and this to me says it all, I, come to, I like the Boys and Girls Club because I feel safe enough to fall asleep. And to me, that just, it says it all. So thank you for your ongoing support. We really appreciate it. And, um, Please feel free to stop by and visit any time. We love visitors, we love guests, and um, we would love to see you at the club. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I'll say something right now. This, this organization is tremendous for the kids. We see kids in all different ways and means, coming from all different backgrounds. It's not a diamond in a rough. This is a, a, a brilliant gem. So I urge your support for this organization. Thank you, Chief. Okay, Article 10. Uh, shall the city appropriate $2,500 to Counseling Service of Addison County? Is there anyone from Counseling Service? I'm Sandberg, and uh, the, I'm president of the Counseling Service Board. We absolutely appreciate Virgenza's support in the past, and we hope that the residents will again support $2,500 for the Counseling Service. 
The counseling service, as you probably know, provides mental health, substance abuse, and developmental services in Addison County. Last year, we provided nearly 83,000 hours of services to residents of Virgins. Um, a number of the services we provide are not properly funded, and we couldn't provide them without community support. Thank you. Thank you. Article 11, shall the city appropriate $2,000 to Elderly Services Incorporated? Oh. <laughs> Mary is on the board of Elderly Services, so um, much appreciate uh, the opportunity to thank the Virgins community for support of Elderly Services Incorporated. It's an adult daycare facility. Um, it's a national model for uh, providing care for elders in our community. The, um, there were over 220 elders served in Addison County. 10% of them came from the city of Virgins. Uh, we provide uh, nursing care uh, while folks are there. We provide respite to family members who need to work, need to provide, to find time away for themselves. Uh, we have a professional staff uh, that provides exceptional care to elders throughout the county. Uh, a, a small uh, bit of information, we also provide transportation. Uh, I'm the head of the transportation department and we provided over 5,600 rides, you may see our vans running through the city, picking up folks um, every day, five days a week and half a day on Saturday. Um, we provide over 100 routes throughout the county on a given week uh, and provide uh, that kind of safe service uh, to the residents of Virgins and throughout Addison County. Uh, the value of the services for Virgin's residents is over $270,000 for your $2,000 contribution. So we really appreciate your uh, continued support and um, hope that you'll vote for this article. Thank you. Okay, Article 12. We're more than halfway through. Uh, shall the city appropriate $2,000 to HOPE? Is there anyone from Hope? Thank you. Um, I'm Danelle Byrong. I am speaking on behalf of Hope today, as I am a proud supporter. Um, Hope, which stands for help, Helping Overcome Poverty's Effects. Hope seeks to assist individuals and families in identifying and obtaining the resources that will help them meet their own basic needs. Hope provides significant goods and services to people in need, including clothing, housing, and heating fuel, medical items, job-related needs, and more. Hope operates the largest food shelf in the county. In 2017, they provided food for 70,299 meals and distributed over 30,000 pounds of surplus farm produce. In 2017, Hope assisted 2,860 individuals in 1,213 households. Over 10% of these were Virgin's residents. Hope helped 175 families avoid or prevent homelessness. They assisted 142 persons with emer emergency medical and dental needs. They helped 103 people get or keep jobs. In addition to meeting immediate needs, Hope works to assist people in accessing information and developing new skills in order to become more empowered and have healthier and more stable lives. During the 12-month period ending September 30th this past year, Hope provided assistance to 278 Virgins residents. Many of these households were served multiple times with large amounts of funds. Hope respectively requests that the voters of the city of Virgins allocate the sum of $2,000 to help defray the costs of providing assistance to town residents in the coming year. To break that down, the per capita contribution of city funds to HOPE is 77 cents. The average per capita contribution of all towns in Addison County is $1.26. Um, personally, I have been organizing a closed drive um, on an annual basis that I am able to truck over an SUV full of clothes and they're so grateful. So um, I was happy to speak on their behalf tonight. Any questions? Article 8. 13. Oh, 13, sorry. 
Yeah. It's the glasses. <laughs> um, shall the city appropriate $2,000 to hospice volunteer services? Anyone from hospice volunteer services? Carol. Hi, my name is Carolyn Thompson, and I'm on the board of the Hospice Volunteer Services. And we're a small but mighty uh, nonprofit with offices in Middlebury. And we have a three prong mission, which is to um, provide uh, emotional and comfort and spiritual care by 200, a, a rotating team of 200 volunteers to persons that are facing death. Um, we also provide that same care for, uh, for bereavement uh, services for people after a death that are coping with the loss of a loved one. And then the third prong of our mission is community education for the entire community about death and dying so that all of us are a little more prepared to deal with uh, death or dying of a loved one or a neighbor. Um, we have a very lean budget, $185,000 that comes from three main sources, uh, fundraising grants and investments, individual donations, um, including business from Sweet Charity right here in town, which you're probably familiar with, and then the town and agency gifts, and that's what this is. I mean, uh, Vigens and other towns have supported hospice for years, and the continued support is so important because it's kind of like those Jenga puzzles. You know, you put those towers together and all the pieces form this. Uh, uh, we need every bit of it to, to operate. It's uh, in Virgins for the last year. We served 21 hospice patients here. We provided eight people with bereavement support. We invited 44 families to a service of remembrance that's very um, moving. It's an annual uh, event down in, in Middlebury. And we also are ready to uh, uh, provide crisis uh, counseling and support in schools and daycare and workplaces if that happens. And uh, there's also a, a very uh, sweet lending library down in our offices with videos and books and kits for children that are grieving. So it's, it's an incredible resource for not only people that need immediate care for their loved ones, but kind of at any point in the process where you're going to need that kind of support. Um, it's a hardworking staff of one full-time person and three part-time people. And we really appreciate your support. I think of hospice as humans helping other humans deal with death, which can be very scary. And it's a lot less scary if you have an organization like hospice with trained and compassionate and willing people to just show up uh, with just a phone call. So thank you. Thank you. I'll get it right this time. Article 14, uh, shall the city appropriate uh, $1,725 to John Graham uh, Emergency Shelter? Somebody from John Graham Shelter? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. My name's Sophie. I work over at the John Graham Shelter. Um, very simply, our mission is to provide food, housing, and services to individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Uh, we work with a whole range of folks from newborn to elderly and what the services we provide are really depends on what they come through the door with, what their barriers are and what their strengths are and we work with each individual and try to support them in what their goals are. And you guys have supported us for a good number of years and I hope you'll support us again. Thanks. Thank you. Article 15, shall the city appropriate $1,000 to Open Door Clinic? Anyone from Open Door Clinic? I'm gonna come up front. I'm just more comfortable so my back isn't everyone. Good evening, my name is Heidi Sulis and I'm the executive director of the Open Door Clinic. And like many of us here tonight, I wanna thank you for your support. You've supported us for many years and we're asking you for another $1,000 for the coming year. Um, 
And for those of you who may not know, we are a clinic for the uninsured and underinsured members of, of this community. Um, we hold seven to 10 clinics per month in Middlebury and Virgins. So twice a month on Thursday evenings, we're practicing out of Little City and seeing folks from Virgins and the surrounding areas. Um, and as I reported in our, our report to the city, we saw in the, in the period provided, we saw 77 Virgins residents. Um, it was a split year, but uh, and last year, your head is probably awash with statistics and details tonight, but I think it's good to give a little bit of background. In, the, in 2017, we saw 802 duplicated patients for 1,365 visits. And that represented, those were visits with our medical providers alone, and we do many other things, but that was a 19% increase over 2016. So I wanna underscore the fact that our free clinics, of which there are nine in Vermont, are still very much needed, even with Vermont Health Connect and all the other possibilities. There are still a lot of vulnerable Vermonters and community members who need our help. Uh, we provide acute, chronic, preventive health care. And one thing I want to let you know tonight, which is kind of new for us and we're really proud of, is we started a dental program two years ago. Um, we hired a very part-time registered dental hygienist and then tried to start a model like our clinic. And we got nine, we're up to nine dentists in our area who volunteer for us now. And I, I wanna do a little shout out and acknowledge Drs. Simler and Congleton because they have seen our patients along with many others in the community. So last year, we served 103 patients in dental care alone and provided 571 procedures for a value of $74,000. So admittedly, it's a small piece in this big pie of unmet need, but we feel like it's a step forward. So uh, what else? We couldn't do what we do without our volunteers, and we had 138 of them last year. So any questions? I know there's lots more to come. Dang, not one? <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Article 16. Shall the city appropriate $1,000 to the Otter Creek Child Center? Someone from Otter Creek Child Center? Hello, I am Trish Dougherty, a board member from Otter Creek Child Center. Thank you for your continued support of our organization. The mission of Otter Creek is to support young children and families in achieving their goals by providing high quality early care and education. Since 1984, we have served over 550 families representing every town in Addison County, including Virgins. Every year we have been in operation, we have served at least one Virgins family, and this year we are currently serving one child. So hopefully we won't have to hold him back, but uh, thank you for your support. Thank you. Article 17, shall the city appropriate $950 to support RSVP of Addison County? Someone from RSVP? Thank you so much for having me. My name is Lynn Bosworth and I'm the program coordinator for RSVP. I've been with the program for the past eight years and I just wanted to provide a few highlights about our program. First, RSVP of Addison County is a volunteer placement organization. We place community members who are 55 and older in nonprofits throughout Addison County, and we meet needs in a whole range of ways, from human services to elder care to health care, education, across the, the board. This allows organizations to increase their capacity to serve the community, including all those organizations that you've heard from earlier this evening. We have hundreds of volunteers that we work with, and we work with approximately 100 different nonprofits throughout the, the county. 
Second, I want to mention that in addition to placing volunteers, we provide a range of benefits that um, benefit local residents. We partner with AARP and we provide a free income tax um, preparation program. It serves hundreds of low to moderate income individuals. Um, and I should mention that there's still opportunities if you know people um, who might be interested in taking part in that program. We offer that right here at the Pixby Library. We provide free health and osteoporosis prevention classes in 20 different locations. It's a widely known and respected program, and those are offered throughout the county. And we also support schools by placing assistance in classrooms through our Green Mountain Foster Grandparent Program. Those are a few of the programs that we provide. And those types of so services allow Addison County seniors to stay healthy, engaged, and financially stable. In Virgins, RSVP supports the Bixby Memorial Library, Virgins Residential Care Home, Ringer Care Home, Armory Lane Housing, Virgins Elementary School, and several other organizations in the area. Lastly, I just want to mention that on average, RSVP donates $1.5 to $1.8 million in volunteer time to support the needs of the county, and that's every year. So that's um, an important part of what we do. And I just want to thank um, you again for having me this evening to be able to speak on behalf of RSVP and for your past support and hopefully your continued support. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So it stands for Retired Senior Volunteer Program, but it's also sort of now stands for RSVP as an invitation to serve anyone who's interested in serving in the program. Any other questions? Thank you. Article 18, shall the city appropriate $1,500 to the Virgins Area Seniors Association? Is there someone from that association here? Hi, this is mine, Paulette Meter, and uh, Shirley McClay and I are here to uh, represent the, the seniors. We meet at Army Lane Senior Housing. A um, little bit of what we do, we have, um, we take trips. We usually take like one big trip a year. And uh, the seniors pay for the, the bus and they pay for parts of, a percentage of things. And then the seniors pay for the rest. Um, they have a paint and sip, which the seniors uh, pay a percentage and the uh, individuals pay the rest. Uh, we have bingo, which we pay for our own bingo supplies. We have um, Tai Chi. Bing, um, bone builders. We have raffles to try and, uh, you know, make some money for ourselves. We have uh, dining fairs like every three months, and the, the seniors donate the things, and anybody else is welcome to donate things too. And I think I'll let Shirley McClay talk of the rest of it. I don't really need that because I got a loud voice in a way. Well, you might. <laughs> I, I think everybody knows Shirley. I'm on the board of the Virgins Area Seniors. And yes, I don't know what we'd do without our Virgins support, especially their financial support, because we really, really, you know, we do a lot of things, and there's a lot of us that wouldn't be able to afford to do these things if we didn't have your support. And we also help with some of the people that can't afford to pay for their meals, we pay for their meals. And uh, which is very, very important. And a lot of these seniors do not get out and do things because they're not, you know, they don't have the financial money to do it. So, yeah, so they come to our senior group and it's really, really nice and it's really great, great to see how much they enjoy it. And I do too. And, and so I, do I. And I love our trips, but I love helping and being on the board. And thank you very, very much for your support. We really, really appreciate it. And I'm thanking all of the area seniors. Thank you. Thanks. Article 19, shall the city appropriate $890 to Vermont Adult Learning? 
My name is David Roberts. I'm the regional manager for Vermont Adult Learning here in Addison County. Um, in Addison County, we served over 150 students uh, in the last year, representing about 10,000 instructional hours. Uh, in uh, Virgins, that's uh, 19 students, including um, high school completion, high school uh, uh, diploma students, GED students, English language students, and co college and career ready. So, just a few minutes about what we do. We're nonprofit. We represent the adult uh, education and literacy system for the state of Vermont. And in Addison County, we provide GED prep and testing services. We have a program with the high schools called the High School Completion Program. So if you're 16 and up and you need a high school diploma, uh, you've dropped out of high school, you can come to us. You can do the work with us, get the diploma from your high school. Uh, we do English language classes. We have three a week. Uh, we do college and career readiness, which means helping students, if they're trying to get it to, into CCV, helping their math scores. If they're trying to get a resume done, creating that. Teaching computer, uh, ASVAB, which is the military exam, um, and a few other things in general, uh, just to help students uh, form a pathway into successful employment or post-secondary education. Uh, we're asking for 189 180, I'm sorry, $890, which is what we've been asking for for many years. We appreciate your support. We need your support uh, uh, to help us do the really good work uh, that we're all really involved in doing. So thank you again for your continued support. Thank you. Article 20, shall the city appropriate $4,000 to Women Safe Incorporated? Is there someone from Women Safe? Hi, <clears throat> my name is Ann Burmeister and I live in Virgins almost for a decade now. Um, and I've been at Women's Safe off and on for the past eight years um, as a transitional housing advocate and now I run the education program. So Women's Safe, I'm gonna quickly read you our mission statement. Women's Safe works towards the elimination of physical, sexual, and emotional violence through direct service, education, and social change. What does that mean? Well, we provide, um, we work with people in a direct, direct service capacity who are dealing with um, domestic or sexual violence in their lives. Uh, we work with people from, I've worked with young, young children um, all the way up to 80-somethings. So we work with everybody. Uh, although we are called women safe, we work with men as well. Um, predominantly women as survivors, but there are male survivors too. That's important to say. Um, we also are in the schools providing education. Uh, we're actually in all, all three of the districts, and we are in Virgins Elementary, middle school, and high school. We work with parents. We do parent trainings and faculty trainings at some of the schools. Um, <clears throat> we also do um, accompaniment for folks who need it. Uh, that may take us to hospitals for rape kits or any sort of exams a person needs. Um, it may take us to the courthouse to provide advocacy um, for a variety of um, legal issues. Um, we work really closely, and I, I meant to say this in the beginning, um, I think Almost every organization here tonight, we have, we have partnered with in some capacity or another. Um, and I support, and I hope you all support everybody here, because one of the things that Addison County is really good at, and I experience this professionally, but then I also hear about it around the state, is we are really good at supporting each other and coming together and um, there's a great collaborative spirit here. So I just want to put a shout out for that. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll get to the statistics. We, let's see, last year, and this is FY17, um, so it would have ended in July of last year, we served um, 4,142 in-person meetings. So that was the amount of times we met with folks or took phone calls for a total of 468 women, children, and men who accessed our services. We worked with relatives and care caregivers of survivors um, of a total of 337 children affected by violence in their lives. 
We provided 433 supervised visits and monitored exchanges through our supervised visitation program. Um, we also have a transitional housing program. We work with folks who are fleeing to get set up in um, safe housing for themselves and their children. And the program isn't just about housing, it's also about meeting a person wherever they are in terms of education or employment needs, um, childcare, to help with the next step, the next chapter in life. Um, we also currently have 75 community volunteers who contributed 9,382 hours. Uh, they staff our 24-hour hotline. And we all couldn't do our work without volunteers, but we couldn't have a 24-hour hotline without them. Um, and with that, I just want to tell you that we have volunteer training every fall. And if anyone's interested in um, working with us to end violence in our community, we'd love to have you. Um, where else am I here? Oh, we also worked uh, closely with Middlebury College to train their mid-safe program, so they do what we do on campus for students. Um, in Virgins, specifically, excuse me, um, we provided direct service to at least, and I say at least because not everybody we work with identifies the town they're from for safety reasons or confidentiality, so that we know of 43 people um, in Virgins and 40 children who are exposed to violence. We also were in, pr provided 14 presentations to 117 adult and student, adults and students in Virgins. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. And um, we are asking for the same amount that we ask for every year. And we're so grateful. We think that not only is it helpful for us to have the money um, that everybody votes on every year, but it's a really important statement about our community's collective commitment to ending violence, that it's not a private, intimate affair. It is a community issue, and we are all in it together. Thanks. Thank you. We are now, finally, at Article 21. Article 21, to transact any other non-binding business that may come before the meeting. Is there any other business that anyone? What, say that again. No, not that I'm not I'm aware of. I've had the opportunity to work with Mel um, on the, as a development review board um, member for a long time, and his knowledge and his guidance and his detail orientation has just been incredible. And this is one part of, of the city. Um, you know, the fire department, the police department, the planning commission, um, several other organizations around here have benefited. You drive down Main Street, you stop in the park, you walk on the sidewalks, you know, a lot of that stuff has been in Mel's hands. And I think that we owe him a resounding, resounding vote of thanks for that. Well, thanks for bringing that up, but Mel will have his special time. <laughs> I can assure you there will be a special time where we will recognize Mel, but thank you. So, is there any other business? If there is no other business... Oh. Sure. Hi, I'm Jim Lanfer. I'm a member of the Virgins Opera House Board of Directors. This wonderful facility here, and uh, we're thrilled, as always, to have the city of Virgins conduct their annual meeting here. 
And um, it's one of the many activities that goes on here in the Opera House throughout the year. Um, the Opera House is, is managed by an all-volunteer board of directors. And an awful lot of volunteering goes on here because uh, hardly a week goes by without something happening in the Opera House, whether it's a rock band concert or a jazz band concert or dance, uh, aerobic classes, dance classes, uh, weddings, movies, carnivali, virgins, uh, a, lot of, a lot of activities go on here. And um, we encourage you all to keep an eye on the marquee out front for events that are going on in the future. Check our website. And we encourage uh, you to become involved if you'd like to be a volunteer, uh, want to be on a wonderful board of directors and do a lot of volunteering. Keep us in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So if there's nothing else to come before this meeting, then I'm recessing this meeting to 9 o'clock, Tuesday, March 6, 2018, at the Virgins Fire Station, Green Street, for voting on the Australian ballot, uh, Articles 1 through 20. Thank you for coming. The meeting is, is recessed. Thank you.